Okay, we are live. All right. Uh, well, good morning. Good morning for us. Good afternoon for our special guest and also uh, our second special guest, uh, Kurt. And both are in Germany. So then okay, uh, it's... And it's a, it's a real pleasure to to you know restart our our uh, if Brazil meetings. So this is the first for different reasons. This is the first in in uh, in 2023. So then I would like to thank Mileni for you know taking a bit of her precious time. I know it's busy time in in, in Germany. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, for, for, for opening up this, this series in 2023, we are probably reaching over 30, uh, encounters with uh, guest scholars from different parts of the world. We already had Kurt and some other colleagues from Brazil and, and from other places. So thanks, uh, again, Mileni for, for being with us. And as I usually do, I have to thank the, you know, the Elf Brazil, uh, you know, colleagues who are here today, Danielle, Juliana, Beatriz, and more probably will come. And uh, the audience of colleagues and, and students who might be, you know, on the uh, on the Café Multilingue do Nupel uh, on, on YouTube. As we always do, so I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Professor Milene Mendes de Oliveira. Uh, she's Brazilian, uh, but she's been in Germany for ten, over 10 years, right, Milene? Exactly. And uh, she's from Minas Gerais, our neighbor state here. So then let me give you a bit of her professional uh, trajectory. So Mileni currently is a researcher at the University of Potsdam, um, um, Germany. I had the pleasure to visit uh, the university last year, and we have lots of plans together, forthcoming plans. Uh, she is uh, the researcher or the, the, the leader, uh, re the lead researcher in the project Radical, so, Milene, if I don't pronounce correctly, you can you can correct me, which means uh, researching digital interculturality co cooperatively, and the principal investigator in the uh, University of Potsdam uh, sub project called Radical UP. So, Milene has a BA uh in english in english at the federal from the, the federal university of ouro preto our beautiful ouro preto so which is ufopi uh in here in brazil then uh she for several years she taught english and also business english in different language courses in, in brazil then uh she has a uh, uh, an, M an MA in Applied Linguistics uh, from the Federal University of Minas Gerais in, in Belo Horizonte. And she was supervised by Professor Ulrich Schroeder. And the title of her thesis was American English versus Brazilian English, Intra and Intercultural Communication in the Classroom. Uh, you know, and then in 2014, uh, she went to Germany to do her PhD in applied linguistics at University of Potsdam, supervised by Professor, well, let me see if I can pronounce correctly, uh, Hans Gersh Wolf, and of course, uh, co-supervised by Professor Ulrich Schroeder. And the dissertation was uh, business negotiations between Brazilians and Germans, conceptualization and practice. And uh, Milene, you can tell this later, I believe, uh, your book came out of this investigation probably, right? Great. So, and then uh, as of 2018, uh, Milene uh, uh, is a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at the chair of present day English language and linguistics. And finally, uh, you know, as I said, since 2020, early career researcher in the BM 
BF, which is the German Federal Minist Ministry for Education and Research Fund Project Radical, as we mentioned already. So Milene's research interests, English as a lingua franca is one of them, business English as a lingua franca, digital intercultural communication, cultural linguistics, intercultural pragmatics, and English teaching and learning. So uh, maybe a little bit after or before her presentation, Milene can talk about uh, her, her book, which I think is very interesting because uh, one of the, you know, not only English as a lingua franca and world Englishes, but also uh, cultural linguistics. So she, her book was published in 2020 and the title uh, of the book is Business Negotiations in English as a Lingua Franca from a Cultural Linguistic Perspective and was published by the Grutier. So she has written extensively uh, books, articles, uh, book chapters, articles and edited works. And uh, um, one of them in, that is forthcoming is the one she shared with us uh, in co, uh, and she co-authored with uh, Luisa Conti called Displaying and Negotiating Power Through Entitlement Claims in Newly Established International Book. Oh, sorry, groups. Uh, the book will be uh, edited by Milene, by Litz uh, and Con Conti and Linehan, and it's called Language and Interculturality in the Digital World that we we'll, this this text that she will explore with us today. So again, Milene, thanks a lot. So please, if you'd like to add something uh, that I, I missed saying here uh, in, uh, about uh, you. Uh, and uh, one good thing that I have to mention before I pass on the floor to Milene is that she she is very interested in the work that we do as a research uh, group. And uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, we will uh, reinforce this uh, exchange between uh, University of Potsdam or Potsdam University uh, in Germany and uh, our university here. So thanks again, Milene, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Savio, for this really nice introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for being here and for your interest. I'm super excited to be here. Um, when, well, I've, I've had uh, lots of exchanges with Brazil since I moved to Germany, uh, but it's really, so this uh, collaboration with uh, Savio is, is brand new. It started last year when uh, he was in Potsdam for a guest lecture, which was really super interesting. It's um, it's available online actually on Redico's um, uh, YouTube channel. So if you're interested, it was very, very interesting. And, and, and this opportunity, so this, this encounter showed us uh, that we actually want to do more and more things together. And we're engaged in, in further collaboration. And um, if everything works uh, well, which uh, should be the case, so Savio is going to come here again and we're going to intensify collaboration in the upcoming months. Um, <clears throat> well, um, today um, I would like to talk to you about uh, my, my current uh, work. Um, and I'm going to start with a short introduction to um, my project. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about a recent um, text I wrote with a colleague of mine and, and Savio referred to this uh, text in the introduction. Um, well, um, I, I hope I can keep to uh, the time we planned around like 40 minutes, right, Savio? Um, and sorry if you need more time it's okay <laughs> thank you um all right I'll, I'll try my best um well uh, let me start yeah this is what i wanted to show you i'm like i have something to say and i wanted to tell you um that i have a dog here and it's my first experience 
uh, in an online talk with the little dog here. So it could be the case that you're going to hear a dog barking very loudly. Um, yeah, but I hope uh, she's going to fall asleep <laughs> very soon. But if not, be, please forgive me in advance. Um, all right, so um, I told you I wanted to tell you a little bit about my project. Redico, and uh, this stands for Researching Digital Interculturality Cooperatively. And this is a project funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, and it's a far year project. <clears throat> I would like to um, tell you that this, this idea of third party funded project here in Germany, I think it's very different from Brazil. Like the idea, the whole concept, the whole notion of a of a, of a project like this, of being a postdoctoral researcher with with such a project. So I'm very happy to take questions. So if you have questions about how this works here in Germany, we can gladly discuss this because I think it's 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 also interesting, you know, like to know um, and also to to see the differences with the Brazilian system. Um, so, and, and Redico, we have a website, which is there, um, and you're invited to take a look at the website. Um, we also have, <laughs> the dog is also is just on the sofa right now, which I cannot allow, just a second. <laughs> I'm Sorry. All right. Um, so um, the project is a joint project, and um, there are four researchers in the project from three different German universities. So it's me in Potsdam, and I'm a principal investigator of my sub project. And then there are three other researchers, two at the University of Vienna and one at the University of Mainz, and the coordination of the project is in Jena. Uh, but each of us has uh, a sub-project, and we are responsible entirely for our sub-project, but we iterate a lot, we talk a lot, and exchange a lot, because we also have some joint studies going on throughout these four years. Um, and, well, take a look also, if you have the chance, at Redico's Twitter account. And there you will see this folder, this, this image here on the right. Um, and it's basically the idea of our project in a nutshell. So everything, all the actions we want to do in these four years, um, including online conferences. And I'd like to let you know in advance that we are planning um, our last conference. Um, for next year, we still have to decide uh, all the specifics, all the details, but it should be um, organized by the University of Potsdam. So uh, I'll be organizing this conference for next year and it, it will revolve around digital interculturality, which is our umbrella topic and language, yeah? And one thing that is a bit different from the other radical conferences that already happened is that there will be a focus on language. And this is uh, because I am the only linguist in the group. So my colleagues are from the, the field of uh, intercultural studies, cultural studies, intercultural pedagogy. But given my interest um, in language, so there will be a focus on, on language for our 2024 conference. So keep posted. It would be nice if you um, would also submit an abstract. It's going to be an online conference, yeah? Um, all right, so then moving on, uh, as I told you today, I would like to talk to you about this one text that I wrote um, a few months ago with my colleague Luisa Conti from the University of Vienna uh, and a partner in the Redico project. Um, the title is Displaying and Negotiating Power Through Entitlement Claims in Newly Established International Online Groups. That's such a long title, I realize now that I'm reading it. Um, but, well, um, I hope it is interesting for you. And one thing that I realize um, 
Well, after sending the text, um, is that well? It's not. If if you take a look at the at the text, the way it is, there there isn't a lot on English as a lingua franca. Yeah, even though English as a lingua franca is is a very very big interest of mine, and but as of now, I'm trying to establish um, um, how I can bring in English as a lingua franca to the game, because I think there is a lot of, there is a lot to say about English as a lingua franca there, yeah? Uh, but it's not as, a, what I have now, the materials I have now, I'm not really looking at English as a lingua franca as a linguistic phenomenon, but as a communication phenomenon, as a vehicle uh, to bring people from different cultures together. Yeah, and this is what, so I'd, I'd also like to hear your ideas. So how do you think I could bring English as a lingua franca more into the whole concept, yeah? Um, well, with that said, I'd like to uh, show my um, structure. This is the, the structure of the chapter and I'm bringing the structure of the chapter because it will also be the structure of my presentation today. So. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the concept of interculturality, which is at the heart of, of the project, of the Radico project, yeah, and super important for my study. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the concept of participation um, and coupled with different uh, notions, so participation and power. And in that part, I'm going to refer to English as lingua franca use, participation and entitlement, participation and dialogue. And then I'm going to get to the empirical study that I conducted uh, with an interactional analysis. And, and then we're going to discuss the main findings. Uh, all right, so to the introduction. Um, as you know, the internet. So the internet gives us lots of new possibilities, lots of new encounters and, and different possibilities for interactions, new interactions with people we wouldn't reach otherwise, yeah, if there wouldn't be internet. Um, and well, several of these encounters are intercultural. And in our project, we follow Bolton's definition of interculturality. He is a German scholar from the University of Vienna, where some of my colleagues are. And he defines, interculturality as um, unfamiliar multiplicity. And this is contrasted with culturality as familiar multiplicity. And what does this mean? This, this looks very abstract at first. It's because usually many people who write or who think about interculturality, so intercultural communication, interculturality, they think that it's only about the encounter of two national cultures. So Brazilians and Germans, that's a prototypical, yeah? Brazilians and Americans and these kinds of things. But actually what Bolton is saying is that culture, this is, this is definitely culture, Brazilian culture, democracy, but culture is much more than that, yeah? And actually in order, for, in order to escape this idea that culture is deterministic, that all people in a culture are the same, he talks about multiplicity. And this is very important because uh, so, for example, to give this example of Brazilian culture, we told you, to give this example of the Brazilian culture, we have um, we have the Brazilian culture. But if you are part of it, you also understand that there is a multiplicity there. There are lots of people from different characters, lots of Brazilians, completely different. But being part of that culture, you understand that multiplicity. So it's it's familiar to you. And that's what he calls familiar multiplicity. This is his idea of multiculturality. So it's a it's a field of action. He, he defines it as a field of action. And it's a field of action where the multiplicity is familiar to you. The conventions uh, of behavior, of thoughts, they're familiar to you. This is a definition of culturality. And he contrasts this with the notion of interculturality. So it's when you go to a new field of action, it can, it can be a country, but it can be a new job. It can be a new online platform, yeah? And the multiplicity you find in that new field of action is unfamiliar. And that's the whole difference. So you cannot understand the conventions anymore. You're, you're a bit at loss because 
um, things don't make sense the way they used to make sense in your culture when when the the situation was a situation of culturality yeah and this is the contrast and um and well basically i would like to stress this that it's much more than just two different national cultures it's any new situation uh you find yourself in any new cultural field of action as bolton would say uh, all right, and then I would like to talk a bit about participation and, and power. And well, as you know, um, participation can be said to be connected to power. Uh, and power has been extensively researched in uh, the social sciences, in the, in the humanities, and we have some big names that have explored um, a power, yeah, in different senses. So we have Marx, you have Viva, you have Foucault. Uh, there, there are lots of writings about power. Well, um, in our study, we looked at power not from that perspective, from Foucault or from Marx or uh, uh, Viva. We looked at power from two perspectives. Um, so first, uh, perceptions of power. This is one thing that we already looked at in a previous study, actually. And well, in a previous study, we compared participants' perceptions of um, groups that used ELF. So, um, and I'm, uh, I forgot to say that this empirical study that we're going to look at in a, in a while, this empirical study is uh, related to a so-called intercultural game. So some uh, university students who met online and played the game, I'm going to explain the game in a while. In a, in a previous study, we looked at, at groups that used English as a lingua franca in contrast uh, to groups that used um, German. And in the German group, there were L1 speakers and L2 speakers. And we compared the reflection reports by those students who were in ELF groups or who were in L1, L2 groups, yeah? And, and then we saw that the presence of first and second language speakers of a specific language in the same group was described as intimidating by several participants, uh, as some of the second language speakers felt disadvantaged due to a perceived lack of communication skills and to hierarchical relations that positioned L1 speakers as more knowledgeable and more entitled to move the discussions forward than the L2 speakers, yeah? And by contrast, the ELF speakers reported um, flatter hierarchies. Uh, well, and then I told you we wanted to look at power from two perspectives. And the second perspective is power as an interactional accomplishment. Um, and this is actually the focus of the paper I'm describing today. And Schneider says that power can be understood as a practical achievement in social settings in which some voices dominate other voices, some points of view prevail in being considered better or more appropriate. In short, power might be seen as a question of whose account counts. Um, we also explored uh, the notion of dialogue in that paper, and that was mostly my colleague Luisa Conti because she wrote her dissertation on, on dialogue, and, and then so from a literature review she conducted for her uh, dissertation, for her PhD uh, dissertation, she, um, she understood and she saw that there are many different conceptualizations of dialogue in general, and in our paper, we contrast dialogue as a synchronous verbal exchange, like similar to like interaction, or uh, dialogue as an attitude, a vision, an ideal. Yeah. So, um, and this was also important for our conceptualizations and our analysis in the paper. And uh, this uh, this idea of dialogue as an attitude or as an ideal can be seen also as a shelter to positive practices in talking interaction. Yeah, maybe you, you want to already start building the bridge between this idea of dialogue, this vision of dialogue and interculturality. Remember, 
like how how this 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 idea of dialogue work in intercultural situations yeah when there are some people some some people like new to the group and these kinds of things yeah just some some prior reflections if you want to to make and then uh we also talked about or we wrote about uh, participation and entitlement and and actually in this part, I want to tell you some of the analytical tools we used for our analysis of interactions in the game. So we have first uh, the notion of epistemic access, and uh, this is connected to social norms. So show, social norms according to which speakers are expected to make claims to which they have access. And uh, so as in Gricean's quality maxim, and that speakers should not inform already knowing participants about some state of affairs. Yeah, this is the idea of epistemic access. So for instance, when you offer a news announcement, so if you tell somebody, oh, I got a new job, the speaker is treating the recipient as unknowing. Otherwise, you wouldn't give this piece of information. By contrast, when requesting a piece of information, for example, oh, what time is it? You are treating the recipient as knowing, yeah? So this is the idea, this is the idea of epistemic access. And we also have the idea of epistemic primacy, <clears throat> which is also important in the analysis. Epistemic primacy. So I have this quote by Stivers et al. Uh, there appears to be a norm that speakers should make assertions only when they have sufficient knowledge and rights to do so and that speakers are more detailed, uh, sorry, and that speakers with more detailed and in-depth knowledge have primary rights to make assertions and assessments regarding this domain. Uh, I like the example quite a lot. So consider the difference between the, the kind of knowledge two people might have about life in Tokyo. One person has lived there for 10 years and another has only visited Although both have epistemic access to the place's merits and deficits, there is a quality difference in the depth of that knowledge, with the person who lived there being treated as having more, as having bigger epistemic primacy, or as having more epistemic primacy than the person who just visited as a tourist. Yeah. So these concepts will be important. And also, and there are two other concepts that are important for the analysis and have been used as analytical notions. Um, well, the, the, the first one I want to mention here is entitlement. And entitlement addresses the social practice of orienting to the rights and obligations of performing specific interactional work. And I'm citing here Asmus and Oshima, uh, and they had a study on uh, strategy making and uh, multimodal displays of, of entitlement. And in this study, they investigate how proposals are made within a strategy meeting in a business context and how these proposals are negotiated in relation to the roles enacted by participants. And um, there are two participants in, the, in this meeting. There is the CEO of the company and there is an HR uh, director. And, and, and they negotiate entitlement uh, in order to discuss each proposal and they enact this uh, entitlement. So what, what is the HR director entitled, entitled to do? What is the, and, and which, decisions is he entitled to make and which decisions are uh, or is the CEO entitled to make. Yeah? Uh, but this, the authors also show that it's not just by the status. Uh, she shows, or actually they show that um, those um, entitlement displays are also negotiated on the go in the here and now of interaction sometimes. Um, all right, and another analytical uh, tool that I want to refer to is that of deontic authority. And uh, this means the right of determining how the world ought to be, the right to determine the future action 
of others. And Stefanovic and Pira Kila maintain that utterances regarding joint actions imply the understanding of how deontic rights are distributed among participants. So through interaction, people are negotiating all the time, who has the right to make the proposal? And, and, and how is this proposal taken by the recipient? So for example, who has the right to make a proposal in the first place? How much authority does she have over the proposal? And we display this authority interactionally. Just to give a very quick example, it's very different um, a situation if I give a proposal like, oh, can you do this? Or please do this, or do this. So I'm, I'm displaying different um, different um, uh, claims to, to deontic uh, rights and, and deontic power and power in general, yeah? Um, all right, so this is, those are the, the notions I wanted to tell you uh, or I wanted to talk to you about. And, and now uh, I'd like to go towards uh, the empirical study that was described in the paper. Um, and I'll start telling you about the game. Yeah, I mentioned the game already a few times. And <clears throat> this is a game that it's like in the middle of, of, of my current study. And what I did is I invited students from different higher education institutions, so different universities, to play a game that was designed by an intercultural uh, study scholar, a, a German scholar called Bolton. And this game specifically is called Mega Cities. And the aim of the intercultural game is to have participants uh, develop intercultural competence. I will not go into the specifics of the game now, but again, I'm very happy to take questions because I think the whole idea of the game is very, very, very interesting. And I'd be happy to explain to you like what the game looks like and, and how it can develop uh, intercultural competence, yeah? But I'm not going to the specifics now, but I just want to give you an overview of what the game looks like in general. So um, we invite students from different universities and then um, we divide them into three groups. So imagine I have two universities from usually from two different countries, and then uh, they're divided into three groups, and each group is supposed to uh, represent one of these three cities here. Do you see in the picture? So there are three cities, and they are kind of neighbors. And in the middle of the, these cities, there is um, an abandoned area. The goal of the game is for participants from cities one, two, and three develop a joint development plan for the abandoned area in the middle and, um, and, and uh, uh, a concept that will benefit all the three cities. In order to do this, they have to negotiate a lot. There are lots of tasks they have to, to, to take and, uh, and this is done over uh, five Zoom meetings, yeah, of two hours each. And they have lots of tasks to accomplish collaboratively. So as you can imagine, there is a lot of talk going on and lots of collaboration, discussions, negotiations, yeah? And this is the basic idea of the game. Okay, so for this study, for this article specifically, I looked at two games that I kind of applied, yeah? And I want you to look at the left side of the slide. You can see that the first game happened in May, 2021. And the second game happened in November, 2021. For the first game, I have students from two different German universities, two uh, German higher education institutions. Um, well, you should know that the first one, German University One, so GU One, uh, there are lots of um, there. There are students from Germany. There are also lots of Erasmus students. It's an exchange program here in in Europe, and then so because of this, there are some students from other European countries in GU One. In GU Two, 
um, there is an exchange program for Chinese students. So there are lots of uh, students from China here and also students from Germany, yeah? For the second game, we have uh, German University one again, but not the same students, completely like different students from game one. And we have a Finnish uh, university, yeah? So it's a different setting. And for this study, I selected two subgroups. Remember I told you that in each game, we divide students into the, those three cities I showed you. So, and each city is a subgroup. And what I did um, was to select one subgroup from each game for the analysis. And how and why did I select those two groups? I selected groups because I selected the, the, the one group that reported the highest level of integration and the one group that reported the lowest level of integration, yeah? And by reported, I mean, um, uh, by reporting, I mean uh, um, what they wrote in their reflection reports and also what they, they, they talked about because there is a final reflection task within the game. All right, so we have these two groups and uh, specifically for this study, I zoomed in into the kickoff session. So this is the first session, the first time students come together, those students from those two different universities. And I wanted to keep this in mind because this is important. And I wanted to think about that concept of interculturality that I talked to you about, yeah? So it's this first situation, you get acquainted with people uh, you have, well, uh, for the first time. So you, you see people you have never seen before and then you start talking with those people, yeah? And also negotiating with those people. And uh, the excerpts we investigated, uh, they, they happened uh, within task two in the game. And this is the task in the game. I'm going to read it out loud for you so that you know what it, what it is about. Um, so... Here is what students are expected to do. So it's called your team. Uh, and this is how it is, it's described. Who in your team has the knowledge and experience and motivation and could handle the tasks below during uh, the simulation game? If no expertise is available for some of the task areas, simply leave the name fields blank. If more than one person has the expertise, enter several names. And here you have, this is done in a collaborative board. Um, and here you have some, some roles to be taken, yeah? Project management, presentation, uh, PR and marketing, and students have to negotiate who will be responsible for each area, yeah? For each field there. Okay. And then the research questions. So what we wanted to know. We wanted to know how was participation distributed in the selected intercultural encounters? And what interactional practices aided participants to negotiate role assignment? And also what practices are shown to foster more egalitarian participation in the game? I won't go into that because of time constraints, but it's described in the chapter. Okay, so with all that, um, I would like to start uh, looking at the data. And I hope you can hear, uh -huh, let's check if, I hope I checked those boxes, Danielle, for uh, sharing the sound, let's see. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you a video excerpt and, <clears throat> and here I have the transcript for the video excerpt. As you can see, so what I did was, um, of course, those are pseudonyms, so those are not the real names. And apart from the name, I also indicated here at the end of the name, which institution each participant uh, uh, belongs uh, to, yeah? So if it's GU2, so German University 2 or German University 1, yeah? So that you have an idea. And so in this case, we have Nora from German University 2 and Alexa from German University one, and uh, please, let's see if this is going to work and pay attention, you can follow the transcript too. Let's see. Um, so who is good with any of these? 
Does anyone have suggestions? I would like to do the presentation part because I'm especially good at presentation and moderation. And by default, all the other ones are not that great. And just in case you don't see me, I can also write my name in that. Uh, um, so it was presentation scale. Yeah. Can you hear that, guys? Yeah, good. OK, so I would like um, I'm going to give you 20 seconds, 30 seconds for you to take a look at the transcript, and then I'm going to play it again. Yeah, that's fine with you. Okay. So let me play it again. Um, so who is good with any of these? Does anyone have suggestions? I would like to do the presentation part because I'm especially good at presentation and moderation. And by default, all the other ones are not that great. And just in case you don't see me, I can also write my name in that. Uh, um, so it was presentation scale. Yeah. All right. And now I'd like to move on to uh, the analysis that we can make out of this uh, excerpt. So as you can see, at this point, Nora is enacting the role of facilitator there. Yeah. At this point, there's no nothing was assigned and so on. So she organically took the role of, of facilitator in this part. And then she opens the sequence. Um, and and she uh, asks a question. So who is good with any of those? And there is a uh, any of these, and there is a silence. And then she recasts her initial question. And what we can see is that Alexa from the other university comes in very quickly, and she expresses her interest to take up a role. Yeah. And then I want to call your attention to the fact that, so she says, I would like to take the presentation part. So she establishes which role she wants to be responsible for. Then there is a justification on epistemic authority. She says, um, because I am specially good at presentation. So I have this knowledge, yeah, I have access. Remember epistemic access and epistemic primacy. So I have this, I have this knowledge and, um, and she takes Alexa herself, she uh, takes the, the issue as decided because she writes, she says um, in lines 15 and 16, just in case you don't see me, I can also write my name, yeah? So she, she doesn't take this as an issue that is worthy of discussion. She just wants, she already wants to write her name. Um, after that, Nora, uh, the moderator, she actually is the one typing Alexa's name into uh, the card, yeah? So here you can see that Alexa takes the issue as decided, so she's displaying high deontic authority. So she's displaying that she has the right to make this proposal and to, to, to take this decision, basically. And Nora is following because she actually, Nora is writing her name there in the card. Now, um, oops, uh, I forgot this part. So she takes she she takes the decision to be established by writing down Alexa's name on the whiteboard, confirming Alexa's deontic authority. And just another time for you to. Uh, um. So, who is good with any of these? <laughs> anyone have suggestions? I would like to do the presentation part because I'm especially good at presentation and moderation. And by default, all the other ones are not that great. And just in case you don't see me, I can also write my name in that. Uh, in um, that so it was presentation scale? Yeah. All right. And this is very interesting if you contrast it to the next one. 
So here, um, this excerpt is divided into two slides and two short video clips, yeah? And this starts right after the excerpt that I showed you. And here we have two things happening. So first, and this is what, this is the topic of this slide here. First, Eileen uh, asks if she can take responsibility for time management. Can you see here line number six? Can I do time management? And please note that Eileen's camera is off. So she's not appearing here uh, on the screen of the video. And, um, and, and just for you to know, please pay more attention to Nora and Eileen's action. And don't pay too much attention to Anton. You're going to see that at the end, there is something that Anton says, but we are not really paying attention to this part right now. Yeah, so that you're not too distracted. Let me play this. Can I do the time management? Oops. Um, yeah, you can put your name. I don't know who, who just said it. <laughs> Maybe that's a good idea because I think for both incoming or every incoming culture, there's always uh, difficulties with pronouncing names. So maybe. Yeah. So I'm giving you a few seconds to take a look at the at the transcript and then I'm going to play it again. Yeah. And remember, just just until the end of line 12 is fine. Okay, so let me play it again. Can I do the time management? Oops. Um, yeah, you can put your name. I don't know who, who just said it. <laughs> Maybe that's a good idea because I think for both incoming or every incoming culture, there's always uh, difficulties with pronouncing names. So maybe. All right, so I'm moving on to the to the next part of the same excerpt. So uh, it starts again with uh, Anton, uh, well, continuing making the point he started making uh, before. And uh, in line 25, take a look at line 25. You have Nora writing Marin's name on concept board. Remember that it was Eileen who asked if she could take responsibility for time management, but then Nora writes Marin's name for time management. Um, and so you can see that there are two names in red here, and I just um, highlighted them a little bit for you to understand that those are uh, actually, of course, in the audio, the real names appear, but I cut. So you're going to the audio, I, I cut the audio, I deleted the, the real names from the audio, only so that you understand that there will be something missing in the audio. It's just because I needed to delete the real names. Yeah, let me play. Difficulties with pronouncing names. So maybe everyone, when he's putting in his or her name or their name, their names, their name, um, just type your name and maybe say how it's pronounced. So maybe we all get a chance to get it right the first try. Mm, time management was to write. Not yes, me. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put because I think you're good at time management. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Again, a few seconds, especially focusing from uh, line uh, 25 on, please. Yeah. Okay. Difficulties with pronouncing names. So maybe everyone, when he's putting in his or her name or their name, their names, their name, um, just type your name and maybe say how it's pronounced. So maybe we all get a chance to get it right the first try. Mm, time management was to write. Not yes. Me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I put because I think you're good at time management. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. 
So let's see what we can make out of the analysis here. So remember that Eileen starts, also she wants to take responsibility for her roles and time management. Um, but in terms of Deontech authority, if you compare with Alexa before, you can see that there is no display of Deontech authority. Yeah. So Alexa, before she said, I would like to do this because I'm good at this. And then here we have, can I do this? Yeah. So no Deontic authority in turn design. And then, oops, sorry. Uh, okay. And then we have, yeah, exactly. And then we have Nora. <clears throat> um, well, first of all, she was busy when Eileen said something because she was doing something on concept board. Eileen had her camera off, so Nora really couldn't see who spoke. And, um, and here she says, well, you can put your name. I don't know who said it, yeah? And then moving on, here we have Nora writing somebody else's name on concept board after some time. Probably Eileen never really wrote her name. Uh, I never explained why. So Nora writes somebody else in uh, somebody else's name in this uh, card. And so she by doing so, she deletes uh, somehow. She ignores, she deletes the, the sequence or the, the turn by, by Eileen before. And um, but then Maren, whose name was written all of a sudden on that um card, she says, well, she repairs the action. She says, well, it's not me. And, um, and, and she says, well, time management was Eileen, right? And Eileen confirms, yes, yes. And Nora justifies putting Marin's name by claiming that Marin is entitled to the task because she knows Marin already. Yeah, so, oh, I know, uh, I think you're good at it in line 32, okay? So let me play both again so that you have a feeling. Can I do the time management? Oops. Um, yeah, you can put your name. I don't know who, who just said it. <laughs> Okay, and then I'm going to difficulties with pronouncing names. So maybe their names, their name. Um, just type your name and maybe say how it's pronounced. So maybe we all get a chance to get it right the first try. Mm, time management was to right? Not yes, me. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put because I think you're good at time management. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, and then this is the uh, third and last example, okay, uh, that shows um, that entitlement. So the two examples we saw, uh, we saw examples in which uh, people were giving entitlement, were claiming entitlement to somebody from the same group, yeah? Uh, or actually, so the first person was giving entitlement to herself, the other person uh, the, the second example, one person giving claiming entitlement for another person from the same group. And here we have a case in which somebody is claiming entitlement for a person from the other group. Yeah. Um, and well, here we have Anton uh, saying he would like to take responsibility for project management. Yeah, this is uh, the focus here of this excerpt. And, and then we have Sophia reacting to this and actually suggesting he should take responsibility for something else as well. Let's take a look at this. Um, but uh, since that part is taken, I would just go ahead and if no one objects, I will do project management. Sure. And my name is, or if you want to pronounce the English way, um, I think you should also be included in moderation skills because you were the one who started the communication like back then. Yeah, I'm quite extroverted, <laughs> so uh, I, I take that as well. I, have no I think it's good. And 
Yeah, so I'm going to give you a few seconds to take a look at the transcript ending this negotiation between Anton and, and Sofia. All right, so playing again. Um, but uh, since that part is taken, I would just go ahead and if no one objects, I will do project management. Sure. And my name is, or if you want to pronounce the English way. Um, I think you should also be included in moderation skills because you were the one who started the communication like back then. Yeah, I'm quite extroverted, <laughs> so uh, I, I take that as well. I, have no I think it's good. And All right. So uh, what happens here? First, we have Anton taking up a role. And here, there is no justification, for example, on the basis of epistemic grounds, yeah, as Alexa did in the first. So oh, I'd like to do this because I'm good at this, yeah? So there is no uh, justification. Um, but there is a certain uh, deontic authority, which is confirmed by Nora, yeah? So he says, I'd go ahead and I would do project management, and then Nora confirms, sure, yeah? Um, and then you have the second part here in which Sophia grants entitlement to Anton based on his epistemic authority, on his knowledge, on his uh, experience with this, and something she noticed based on his communicative conduct in the game that just started. So, and she, she could make this, this uh, judgment, this assessment of his, um, of his epistemic authority, yeah? of his epistemic access to this. And just playing it. Um, but uh, since that part is taken, I would just go ahead and if no one objects, I will do project management. Sure. And my name is, or if you want to pronounce the English way, um, I think you should also be included in moderation skills because you were the one who started the communication like back then. Yeah, I'm quite extroverted, <laughs> so uh, I, I take that as well. I, have no I think it's good. And All right. So those were the excerpts I wanted to show you. Um, in the paper, there are some uh, more excerpts, uh, but mostly I think I, I wanted to show you um, cases that, that illustrate the most important findings in the paper. And well, here we have different situations um, uh, that, that answer the research question we, we, we established for our study. And just to remember, to, to remind you of the research questions, we wanted to know how participation was distributed in the selected intercultural encounters between the two groups, yeah, participating in the game and what interactional practices aided participants to negotiate role assignment. So which interactional practices did they use? And then, so the first finding we have is that uh, a, a common practice is claiming entitlement for oneself, yeah? And, uh, and we showed that this is linked with displaying uh, epistemic access and epistemic primacy. So I, I want to do this because I can do this, because I have the knowledge and so on, yeah? Another uh, finding is that uh, in some cases we have a display of entitlement for an in-group member and often also connected to displays of epistemic access and primacy, like when uh, Nora says, oh, I put your name for time management because I think you're good at it, yeah? And, and this can, um, these, these claims are regarded as legitimate due to acquaintance and familiarity between the members, yeah? And then we have the third case uh, in which entitlement was shown um, to a person from the other group. But in this case, there isn't familiarity and acquaintance since this is the first encounter between 
they involved the speakers. In such cases, the claims were connected to perceptions of communicative behavior of the fellow player in the initial moments of the game. Um, and well, and we also showed that, um, we showed examples uh, of when proposals are made by speakers who claim uh, no deontic authority or no entitlement whatsoever. And this results in magnifying the, the deontic authority of the moderator and not really, uh, well, to the, the detriment of authority of the person making the proposal. So this suggests that um, existing group membership or coach reality plays an important role in facilitating access to or inclusion in intercultural groups. So if I have somebody paving my way and saying, well, Milani is good at this, she could do this, this facilitates inclusion. Existing group membership can also hinder access to some members who display low deontic authority. Yeah, so it was the case with Eileen. Yeah, can I do this? And then the camera off, no deontic authority. And then somebody goes there and says, oh no, not Eileen, let, let me put Marin here because I know Marin and I know she's good, yeah? And a third, so in relation to uh, letter C there, we have um, the suggestion that inclusion can be done via communicative conduct too, yeah? So it's not just acquaintance and familiarity, but it's also the communicative conduct in the game. A possible uh, question that can be asked in the case of inclusion uh, because of communicative conduct and not because of familiarity. Um, I'm very curious to, to understand this. I, I would like to explore this question further. And the question is, what does it take for communicative conduct to be ratified as legitimate by newly acquainted people. What did Anton do that made Sophia think he is entitled for the job, even though she, she doesn't really know him, yeah? Um, and well, and, and that's basically what I wanted to say in relation to the findings and, and uh, the empirical analysis I did for this study. But I mean, zooming out a little bit, I think we could start, we could, think, uh, and we could make lots of reflections about interculturality, so this, this intercultural scenario and how people find their ways into, into the group, and also in relation to the vision of, uh, of true dialogue, because actually this is a, a, a situation that is non-hierarchical. We just have st university students talking to each other and building relationships, and one could think that this is this, this uh, could be the way towards the vision of openness, flat hierarchy, and, and a world of, of, of dialogue. Um, but as we could see, people start building hierarchies and start displaying power, even yeah. in this very, very symmetrical scenario. Yeah? And yeah, so those are just those are just some reflections, and I, I will keep on on uh, reflecting on these on these points further. And I'd be very happy to hear what you think uh, about all this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Milani. <clears throat> Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. I would say, <clears throat> of course, uh, I believe you have a fantastic corpus that you can investigate from different perspectives, including, of course, English as a lingua, the, as, it, as you said, the role of language. And uh, I was reading, I was checking here exactly when you say at the end of the text, when you say the last factor we want to call attention to is language, as language skills have shown in previous investigation, investigations to impact the development of power relations in virtual groups. In our game, the language spoken, of course, was English as a lingua franca. Uh, and then the willingness to communicate uh, in a foreign language is a further important factor that regulates participation. So then 
you also at the very beginning, I, I found it very interesting. The in and it's it, we can see that, for example, these analysis so these interactions they produce so much material that you basically worked with very you know <clears throat> i think it's a fraction of the corpus you have and then at the very beginning you asked us uh how can we explore uh the linguistic aspect so or english as a lingua franca etc etc so then i think you had this experience a little bit uh in in your uh it's in your book when you say that you through uh you know not only world english is when you uh worked a little bit uh in in and also uh english as a lingua franca uh working on um especially on uh, communities of practice right so but anyway that i i think uh we can hear from our colleagues <clears throat> that there are I think there are wonderful avenues for you to explore the linguistic aspect here. And especially because it is, as you said, and we could see, it is a, a an elf context, right? Even though uh, you have, as you said, you have uh, students in Germany, but of course they come from different countries and, and they have like, they probably, several of them are bilingual, and, and also in the in the Finnish uh, context. So then I of course I have I'm going to make a, one question and then I'll I'll uh, have the other ones uh, uh, to say something. But then my question is throwing back to you out of your experience, thinking of the work you conducted in business and and, and uh, you know you have a lot of experience with with business and we can even say Belf you know, business English as a lingua franca. So then how can you, uh, you know, uh, working on the corp or the corpora that you already have, so how can you, what are your ideas to intensify the dialogue with elf studies? So can you tell us more? Can you explore this uh, a bit more? Because I can see lots of ideas, but I would like to hear from you because I know you've been doing this. Uh, and, and, and of course, your insights on interculturality are extremely important because we, of course, we emphasize the intercultural and in our case, even the decolonial, um, let's say, facet of elf as a lingua, of English as a lingua franca. So... I would like you to expand this a little bit, and then I'll pass on to our colleagues to, you know, to ask you more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Savio. Um, yeah, and, and uh, this this uh, triggers me to uh, reflect even more uh, about how I can actually build this bridge. But I do have some ideas, as you as you said, and. One one uh, point I think is very very easy, like to to make this bridge, and I want to explore further, is the idea of transience that has been explored mm -hmm. by Lisa Pitzel and yes, other scholars. Yes. Um, because the data I have allows me to to uh, follow participants' uh, trajectories. Mm -hmm. uh, to the, the 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 Zoom encounters, yeah, five weeks meeting to, uh, once a once a week, um, and for two hours, people who are not acquainted with each other, and then how they they negotiate communicative practices in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. and how this develops, yeah, how this develops throughout those uh, encounters, and and mm -hmm. this idea. Transience by Marie Louise Pitts is very interesting because it's it's something that is in between. It's not just a one-off encounter, but it's mm -hmm. not an opportunity of practice either because those people are just meeting a few yeah, times. Yeah, they come and go. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They come and go, and then but but still, they're probably developing something together. They have to, yeah. They yes, have yes. to be learning from each other's practices, and they mm -hmm. have to be creating something. Uh, which is kind of uh, um, uh, prop or which is which is specific to this group, yeah. And maybe mm -hmm. also at well different different um, levels of of joint work. Maybe that group that didn't really get integrated, 
they have uh -huh. joint communicative practices, then the group that creates a lot of synergy that where there is a lot of engagement, maybe with this, having uh, uh, more like, joint communicative practices. So I mm -hmm. think transience mm -hmm. is something that can be employed there. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, I'm also, I'm, I'm so interested in like how the group develops and um, I don't know, I think because actually um, Seilthofer, I, I wrote, I, I read in a uh, chapter or an article she wrote uh -huh. uh, we should start looking at elf also not just from the perspective of of linguistic of a linguistic yes. phenomenon but also yeah. as a communicative a communicative vehicle and i think this is exactly where this build can be bridged with interculturality yeah mm -hmm, so it's, it's mm -hmm. more than which which linguistic aspects are being used and it's more about like how people are communicating creating synergies inclusion or exclusion yes, yes. in intercultural scenarios and this is kind of what i'm, I'm very interested mm -hmm, in. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i would say that the power factor you know interests me a lot mm -hmm. because lots of things can happen and not happen you know around the power factor so but then this is this is this is like say food for further discussion <laughs> okay thank you milena so oh Eleni, sorry uh anybody please take the floor i think julie has uh two questions right julie? okay great hi yes but poliana asked first so maybe polly wants to go first is that okay I, I can go Sorry, first. Sorry, <laughs> Yes. So, hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hi, Professor Villani. Many thanks for your talk today and for sharing such an interesting study with us. Wonderful insights. Well, when, when reading the text you sent us, I was wondering how the game actually works. And I even tried to search on the internet for some information, but I could have a better idea from, from your talk today. So thanks for that. I don't know, and maybe I I missed some information about Radico, but when reading the text, I was also wondering what the participants' learning context was. I, I was especially curious about the motivations behind the participants' collaboration. I mean, uh, why do they get together to start working on a collaborative project? You know, do they get together to... Uh, practicing English through an intercultural interaction. So uh, could you please provide some more information about this point, Milani? Thanks a lot, Feliana, for your question. I think it gives me the chance to explain a bit more about the game uh, and the context of data collection. I think it's super, super important. And well, actually, so for this, for, for this study, um, I brought students together really to record uh, the, the sessions and do research. But the game was not created for research. The game was created for de the development of intercultural competence. And I'm not the first one to apply the game. The game has is being applied with different groups. And actually, there is a there is an association. I don't know how this is called really like from the University of Vienna, there is a uh, spin-off, I don't know, but they provide intercultural training. It's a nonprofit organization connected to uh, the chair of intercultural studies from the University of Vienna. And they provide uh, training, intercultural training to companies and to universities. Um, and this is one tool that they have and that they apply for the development of intercultural competence. And, um, and when they do this, so not for research purposes, but with the aim of the game in mind, they select uh, uh, university students from different countries, different universities, and they bring them together. And they don't only apply the game, so because the game is about I told you the idea that is about developing a joint project, yeah? So there are three cities, 
and then they have to develop, uh, a, uh, they have to create a development plan for an area in the middle of these three cities. And then students are doing activities like, oh, uh, what do you think is important for the education system? What do you think is important for uh, industry? And so they have to negotiate all these things. Um, and, but it's not just doing the tasks for, for the people from, from this organization I'm telling. They also reflect upon the tasks. So they always have debriefing sessions and then they, they refer back, oh, how did this negotiation go? How did we include participants here? Or how did we exclude? So the game itself is coupled with the debriefing sessions in all the five sessions in, so that they can reflect, not only do, not only perform the game and the tasks, but also reflect about how they're doing this and how they're negotiating this, yeah? Um, and then, so at the end, they are going to have a joint development plan for this area in the middle, and and this is how they 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 finish the game and so on. So that it's um, if you if you want to have more details, uh, Poliana, um, please contact me, and I I can give you uh, all the details and also um, show you some of the tasks that are part of the game. Yeah. Thank you. It was very informative, Milani. Thank you very much. Okay. So, hi. <laughs> I'm going to ask the, the next question. Um, thank you, Milani, for your presentation and for joining us today, for finding the time and all that. I really appreciate it. And I have a special reason to appreciate it. It's because I also did my PhD in, you know, conversation analysis and intercultural communication and health specifically, how to negotiate, how people were negotiating uh, cultural understandings. Um, so I wanted to hear from you first a more generic uh, top from a, about a more generic topic and then something specific about your paper, the, the chapter uh, first. How do you see, uh, I don't know, the connection between uh, maybe the contribution between uh, from conversation analysis into language teaching and maybe even uh, language teach the uh, language teacher education? Uh, because I felt like it, it was a, a missing piece in my education. Like uh, I took one only one semester one course as an optional course and the, the professor offered once like you know in a lifetime and i think many people miss this opportunity and i i hope i i don't know right now as somebody who has delved into it more deeply i think it could inform teaching like in such a, a special way but i'd like to hear from you how do you see this connection and how do you think we could change this um i don't know Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this question. And um, well, to be honest, uh, Juliana, I don't I don't consider myself a conversation analyst, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. But I discovered it just like short time ago. And um, and when I collected the data, I had a different study in mind. I had um, <laughs> a study. Uh, I wanted to to conduct a study on conceptualizations of culture really through like metaphor studies and so okay. on but when I looked at the data I'm like oh my god there's so much going on here in terms of interactional practices that I need to learn how to look at this data from an interactional perspective yeah. I started learning really about conversation analysis and I was super impressed and I think it's 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 such a powerful tool for for so many things that happen in, in interaction and of course for um, language educate language teaching and and for uh, teacher education as you say it's it's super important I know there are lots of people doing very very uh, good work on this but I think uh, in general um, actually I was just talking to a colleague of mine Tayani Malababa she is a colleague uh, at the University of Potsdam and she's very she is a CA uh, so she is a conversation analyst really <laughs> and um, she uh, uh, does research on um, classroom discourse and, and, and um, 
Mm -hmm. yeah classroom interaction yeah and and we're just talking how important is it would be to have also didactic materials based on 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 ca findings yeah um and because for example now my look at ca with for instance deontic authority yeah mm -hmm. and how how we this this is something that can be implemented into didactic materials yeah mm -hmm. how can how can you actually make a proposal uh, in a way that displays authority or in a way that that actually mm -hmm. displays no authority at all? So I see a lot of potential. Uh, I think it's a very, very important uh, field to to explore. And yeah, so it's 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 very interesting to know you you do research also into CA because maybe this is, this is something you'll be doing, <laughs> uh, implementing those very oh, no. important into, into materials, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad I've got support. <laughs> <laughs> like, because uh, I'm very interested in, in doing that, like using the contributions from the findings. I don't do exactly like CA, CA, it's pure CA, but I combine CA and uh, cultural analysis, like cultural pragmatics. So uh, mm -hmm. it's both of them. So, yeah, thank you. So next question. Um, <laughs> uh, the next question is, I... I was actually puzzled when I read in the text when you said um, ELF and L1 and L2 speakers, because I thought the L1 would, you were saying, would be like L1 English speakers and L2 English speakers, and then you put ELF separately. But then in the presentation, it became clearer that you were saying L1 German, right? And L2 German. So the, the question I have is... Uh, do you think, well, from your text, I can see that you kind of already take that perspective, but I would like you to maybe expand on it, uh, if that's okay. Um, do you think that the power relationships, even in the linguistic power relationships and the cultural power relationships from outside that environment influenced how they related to each other in English? You know what I mean? Because maybe they didn't feel confident to express themselves in English because they don't feel very confident in German. You know, you know what I mean? Do you think there is an in relation? Yes, for sure. I think there is, um, uh, this influences also very much like how they express themselves, that there are actually lots of, lots of influences going on there. And um, actually I, I just, um, because I'm also very interested in the cultural part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and for example, I have like uh, Chinese students, lots of Chinese students in the game as well. I didn't show any excerpt here, but and and there there is very likely a cultural influence uh, also acting there mm -hmm. in those interactions with the the, the German students, even if it's uh, English as a lingua franca. There is there is something that, that they bring with them, yeah, to the interaction. Mm -hmm. The only thing, and I think you'll, you might agree with me, it's very difficult if you're using the conversation analytical lens or lenses, how do you, how can you bring those things into the game as well? Because actually, um, uh, well, if you, if you are, well, I don't think there are lots of studies exploring this from a conversation analytic uh, viewpoint, yeah? So, um, how do people do like, for example, those uh, cultures, yeah, Chinese culture, Brazilian culture in mm -hmm. interaction in English as a lingua franca, because there, there are lots of layers there. And uh, usually in conversation analysis, you have, you want to break it out. Yeah, you want to look. So if you're a pure conversation analyst of some yeah. orientations, you want to break it out everything that is outside of the interaction. And you yeah. just want to look at the, the specificities of turn taking there. That's right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I can imagine it's a challenge for you because if you are interested in, in, in those aspects, mm -hmm. so how do you Right? How do you bring those 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 notions together? It's super interesting mm -hmm. and valid, but um... yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was asking you because um, I know that, like you said, this, a pure CA you can't really find information just from the conversation itself. Um, so 
to do what we do, I, I'm going <laughs> to include you. Uh, um, we actually need like maybe interviews. We need to do some ethnography on the side to complement that information. That's what I did in, in my PhD. Um, so I say I'm not doing pure CA here. I'm using mm -hmm. CA as a tool. Yeah. But then I'm also complementing it with some uh, interviews, some uh, observations, field notes, etc. So I, I guess I was asking you from like as somebody who was uh, in contact with the students and as somebody who knows, you know, their background, how you felt their relationships like and the power relationships outside that the interaction influenced the interactions, you know, in that sense of their use of English. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that ethnographic um, uh, data, and uh, I, I just because it was also a bit like the period of the pandemic, and I never really met students, so it was everything oh. organized online. Was online. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was online. Yeah, okay. and I actually, so I do have some some extra data from the learning reports that they wrote. Uh, learning journals and so on, but I miss that. And if I am to do the study again. I want to do much more. I want to learn much more from yes, like yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. the graphic side. It, it should be there. You're completely right. Yeah, well, cool. Thank you. Then I think Professor Khan would like to say something, right? Yes. Oh yeah, I have to, <clears throat> okay, my phone. Yeah, thanks, great talk. And uh, I think these last comments I find particularly interesting because I, I'm deeply convinced from our own uh, uh, small studies that we need to take in more information about the speakers than mm -hmm. just the uh, linguistic manifestations. As, mm -hmm. as linguists, mm -hmm. we are kind of focused on language, but language, I mean, is just the surface, is just yes. the surface of things. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. we, we, we are not really able to understand uh, what to make of this surface, unless we take a look at what is underneath. I mean, the currents and the obstacles and whatnot. And in this uh, case, I, I would find it uh, particularly interesting to, to know uh, how these speakers um, see themselves, who they are, how they perceive themselves, how they want to be perceived by others, in general, how they want to be perceived in this particular game, in this particular exchange. I mean, this is where, I mean, I, I like to, to talk about requirements of communicative and communal success as uh, speakers entertain. And these requirements um, from very simple ones, like I want to be understood, I want to express myself, up to um, I want to participate in a group. Um, uh, cooperativity and empathy is important for me and all these things, all this has a very, very strong impact on how I behave in this uh, exchange. And in this connection, um, one a concrete question, I mean, do you have data? Because I wasn't able to, to read your paper, I didn't have this information. Um, uh, did you look at how these things, I mean, there is the, the, the role assignment at the beginning you talked about, and how did it develop throughout the game? Did you notice that there were changes? Because this is something we noticed in very interesting um, uh, aspects, that, that this role assignment uh, uh, changes throughout um, a longer uh, conversation that uh, people who, uh, yeah, well, for various reasons and uh, this kind of thing, yes. Sorry, Kurt, I will send you the paper after we finish here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for your comments. I think they're super, super relevant. Unfortunately, I, so I don't have, I haven't really empirically traced yeah, how, uh, the role and uh, how how take how 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 the action of taking up this role from this moment until actually like the development of the game until the end of the game. So this is one thing I can definitely do with my data. I'm actually overwhelmed. There is so much to look at <laughs> there, and uh, there is so much to do. Uh, but this is something possible. Uh, and I do agree with you very very much that it's very important to know. 
uh, what they bring to the game. Uh, I like very much, I, I really hadn't thought um, uh, too much about that. What do they want actually? What What is their goal participating in this? And, and how uh -huh. does they develop yeah. according to the book? Because actually like for, if you take this transience perspective from Marie right. Louise, and so mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. transience is also about this. So you should understand uh, uh, I think Marie Louise Pizza says T zero. So what what do they have there at the beginning? You need to understand mm -hmm. everything, all the variables that they bring to the table at the beginning, in order for you to understand how they develop. Yeah. So it's very important to actually understand their motivations as well. Yeah. And and as you say, not just like which other languages they speak and and, and the levels of so and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. much more there. And yeah, and in this connection also this this um, aspect of who do they want to be. This this yeah. is where identity yeah. comes in. And I mean you know the elf literature and and elf communication being oh so successful, which in yeah. my uh, own experience it isn't. I mean when I look at my own communication and when I look at the communication of others and and even when you are more advanced, then you uh, you probably find yourself in situations where the others would say, "Well, fine, excellent, and everything," but you yourself, you are not satisfied with uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how you communicate it. Simply, well, you know what you wanted to achieve. You wanted how you uh, you know how you wanted to come across. And, and I, I find this particularly interesting to, to take this, um, uh, this dimension into account and, and to go, I mean, elf success, communicative success is way more than intelligibility, of course. Yes, yes. But, but in elf, they're always talking about intelligibility. Yes. Very, this is, <laughs> yeah. very, very good point. I just would like to mention that, well, I, I, I have a grasp of this a little bit with my data because I have the learning journals, yeah? And then I can really see like some after each session, students write how they kind of felt and, and so on. Uh -huh. Some oh, yeah. of them just, some comments are just really like not very helpful. They just really describe what happened in the game. But some of them are really very interesting. So for example, I have a very, there is a very skillful participant in the game who takes up facilitation like organically and his group is very successful and um, like very engaged in the sense, yeah? And mm -hmm. then in his learning journal, he orients to this, like, oh, I wanted to make my Finnish uh, uh, pl fellow players, uh, I wanted them to feel welcome in the group because they're new and blah, blah, blah. So you have a little bit of his orientation already in the learning journal, but this is not systematic through all the learning journals. So it, it would uh -huh. be very interesting to, to, to think about this when conceiving of this study, that this also gets kind of uh, collected in a systematic way, those impressions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Milena, based on this, I have uh, out of a curiosity, how were these um, participants selected? So it was on a voluntary basis. Uh, did you, for example, what were the criteria for them to, to you know, to be part of the, of the, the project? And I have uh, one more question. Uh, of course, you had two groups, uh, uh, two, univers two German universities and a Finnish university. Why did you choose a Finnish university? Uh, and uh, would, I don't know if you remember, but then uh, were there any significant cultural clash, you know, in, in the groups? So if, uh, so for example, uh, which groups could you identify some type of uh, if they they existed in terms of culture clash? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the questions. Um, well, uh, criterion selection criterion. It was convenience, convenient sampling. <laughs> so it was um, basically. So I offered courses at the University of Potsdam online uh -huh. courses. I have uh, student assistants working with me and then they helped with the whole uh, data collection recording and so on. So it was very practical. Um, so this, it was a university course and then I, this was the course description. So there would be a game in the course. And ah, so okay. Uh -huh. there, were, there were also some other activities after the game. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, 
and the Finnish university is because I happen to have colleagues at uh, the university. So at the Finnish university, <laughs> don't want to say the name here. I don't know. Um, uh -huh. and, and, uh, and, and I have colleagues there and then they, they uh, recruited, sure. they did the same thing. So they right. offered the course right. and the game was part of their course. And they are right. also interested in doing research on English as a lingua franca. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And to answer your question about the cultural clash. Uh, yes, I have lots of uh, reflections upon this. Um, and uh, for example, with the group, there was a group in which most of the, the participants, one of those subgroups I showed, in one of the subgroups, most of the participants were from China. Mm -hmm. And then the other groups uh, were mostly German. And there was a clash in the concept because actually, remember I told you they have to create a development plan, yeah? Sure, for sure. this area in the middle. The German group created a plan based on sustainability. Right. The Chinese group created a plan based on this industrial power. <laughs> and they <laughs> noticed this. They noticed this. And they talked about this uh -huh, as a uh -huh, uh -huh. clash. Like, we never said anything, but they noticed this. So this is the first game with the German and the Chinese students. The second game was with the Chinese and the Finnish students. And in this game, all the groups created projects based on sustainability. sustainability. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. So I think this was this was something. Yeah, I think this this refers sorry it refers back to what uh, Kurt mentioned. So we have to know the people. So we have to know their background. And of course, coming from Chinese, you know, this is you know in many ways it represents what china you know uh at least at the moment is uh, concerned about while um most countries in europe are more concerned about sustainability yeah yeah and how how were these clashes dealt with mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I i don't think so i don't think they had the chance in the game to work it out through the they uh -huh. actually they had to negotiate, yeah. They had right. to negotiate, and at the end, actually, with this this group, they were able to accommodate like both things. Uh, they mm -hmm, they tried. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a fictional game, of course. You can just yeah. accept and bring in all ideas, so it's not uh, mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. um, uh, difficult to do that. Uh, so I think they could they could accommodate those those different uh, orientations well in the development plan. Uh, which mm -hmm. is okay, mm -hmm. uh, but they especially they there is uh, at the final in the final um, session of the game there is a reflection. So they're uh -huh. supposed to talk about their experiences in the game and how they felt and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And then uh, the Chinese group said um, very clearly, "So wow, that was such a big difference. Our focus on industrial power." And and the European students, they just want to talk about nature and so on. So that we had yeah. some very interesting, um, very interesting kind of utterances there from this reflection round. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But I think this is also an important part of interculturality. Yeah, this yeah. Aha yeah. Moment, this moment in which you realize, wow, people really think very differently. But it's mm -hmm. not just. I think it's also important to to relate um to 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 make a connection it's not just like the essence you know like of like the chinese it's it's the the, the discourse around yeah yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. discourse and there's so much going on yeah yes kurt yeah maybe a quick comment concerning the issue you um you brought up earlier regarding elf and how uh -huh. to bring in an elf perspective. Um, I, I tried to think about it while you were talking, and uh, I, I found all these things you talked about uh, very, very interesting and, and, and relevant. And it's on a, on a, on a diff, but it's on a different uh, dimension in a way. And also this uh, question, uh, 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 Juliana, I think, uh, uh, asked this concerning pedagogical implications. Mm -hmm. And with regard to, to um, looking into ELF and ELF communication, I think we would need to raise the question, which was not your question here, um, we would need to raise the question, what makes ELF communication uh, successful? How mm -hmm. are speakers able, even with limited resources, 
How are they able to cope with the situation? And this is where um, um, uh, well, this goes back to Henry Widdowson, uh, 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 communicative uh, capability and mm-hmm, speakers' mm-hmm. natural communicative capability uh, comes mm-hmm. in. And uh, I, I myself, I would expand it a little beyond um, Henry's uh, uh, conceptualization of this. And it kind of includes, of course, all these things we know from pragmatics concerning um, uh, inferential processing and all these things. But it also includes uh, cooperativity and empathy and uh, and communication monitoring uh, and negotiating things, common ground and all these things. Mm -hmm. And this is something um, which... um, um, foreign language speakers are usually not, um, they fall, they are not able to uh, fully um, uh, exploit their natural capability to resolve Mm -hmm. issues because they are so, so focused on language. On language, yes, yes, absolutely. And Mm -hmm. and I think it's uh, in order to, uh, to improve this, it would be necessary to um, to um, help students become aware of uh, how essential it is to go beyond beyond language, language. And, yes. and and to make them aware of all the other things that are yes. there and mm-hmm. they need to activate in order to bridge gaps and 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 well cultural gaps and yes, so forth. yes. Yeah. absolutely totally agree for it absolutely. Okay, thank okay. you. Milena, okay. are you going to say something? Okay, Milena, sorry, go ahead. Daniel, Daniel. yes, go ahead. Just uh, have... say thank you to, to uh, Kurt Kahn, thank you. Mm-hmm. We have a question from YouTube, but uh, before I'd like to make a question myself. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's in line with what Professor Kahn just mentioned. Uh, when, you, when I was reading your, your article, I was thinking that, you know, talking about power, so you mentioned it before, right? That it's it's a subject that interested us, right? Uh, I was thinking that ELF is celebrated as a way to take away the uh, exclusive power over the language from native speakers and distribute it among speakers around the world. And then we're going to live happily ever after, right? So your research reminds us that, you know, power, uh, power dynamics go far beyond this, right? It is... Uh, and it reminds me what Foucault mentioned about uh, micropowers that they manifest and operate at the you know everyday level uh, in subtle ways, right? And they contribute to the maintenance of power structures, right? So my question is: thinking about these micropowers, did you notice uh, among the people who claim rights uh, or display rights? Did you notice any kind of pattern? For example, do white people claim power more frequently, or men? or native speakers, or anything that our uh, flawed Western society, for whatever stupid reason, already grants someone? Thank you so much for this question, Danielle. Yeah, I think this is definitely something one can and actually should, must look at. Um, I don't have the... um, I don't have the background, I don't have the capability to, to do this kind of research, because it's not really my background, but like from already from from my lay position yeah concerning concerning those those uh um uh categories you just mentioned now definitely i can see patterns but i'm not tracing them empirically because i it's not my um it's it, i'm i'm not doing research into those topics but i should i think because it's 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 so it's just so uh, obvious sometimes that it is there, there there seems to be uh uh some patterns of some groups of people kind of doing some practices that are more uh oriented towards exclusion and, un- and not inclusion and so on so i think it's very important and i think this is this is one thing i'm i'm learning a lot now i'm i'm, I'm reading a lot about um social linguistics in general, and uh, Jan Blomart and so on, Ben Brampton. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and what I see there is that what we have as linguists and as social linguists is 
uh, the power to study practice, like the micro practices you just mentioned, yeah? In the social sciences, Foucault and, and lots of big names in the social sciences and humanities, they look at the macro perspective. We have the power to go there and look at the micro politics of like exclusion, you know? And because it's so difficult to actually, for example, it's it's, there is a lot written about racism on a on a macro perspective, yeah. Uh, but how to do research on like structural racism? How how do you? And then you need to you need to understand, and you need to to be able to to um, to analyze those micro practices. It's not just about like really offending somebody on the street, you know, like openly. It's about like repeated patterns of exclusion that happen in a way that most people don't even notice and if we can yeah. show this i think it's super powerful i should i should be doing this <laughs> i will in the future <laughs> great then you, you uh, your microphone yeah yeah i noticed <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna thank you very much, Milani. Uh, I'm gonna share screen uh, and I share a question from from YouTube. Okay, just one second. Yeah, we we take. I think we have only this question, right, Daniel? Because it's right. almost time. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's that's. This is the. These are two questions. Right. I mean, okay. uh, it's, only one, it's only one, a big one. <laughs> so uh, from from, the, from our colleague Volney. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Volney says, "I've just explored a little bit of radical." site and i think it's amazing congratulations to the whole crew i'd like to know a little more about the contributions of professor milani's research to the project mentioned on the site thank you <laughs> thank you thank you for the question and uh, i'm always happy to talk about radico because um so it's this it's the the joint project with my colleagues from yen and mines and well <clears throat> Uh, we have a four-year project with different actions, including uh, online conferences. Ah, maybe you want to uh, take a look at the conference, at the Radico online conference that will happen in um, July this year, June, July this year. And well, and in this project, we have uh, four, we, we call them co-studies because we're always doing a study with another radical colleague, yeah? And, and for my uh, two studies, so I started this first study with my colleague, Luisa Conti, my co-author in this article. And we're doing studies uh, and, and writing lots of publications and doing analysis on the intercultural game. And now I'm uh, in the middle of a data collection for my second study uh, with my other colleague, Roman Leeds. Um, and we're going to look at, at social media communication of diaspora groups in Germany. And all this, so, and this is what we are doing now. And then there are uh, my other colleagues, Fergal Linehan and Luisa Conti, they, they have another joint study going on right now, and they're looking at Twitter communication. So there is a lot, and we are doing all this because we want to understand uh, this how interculturality, this concept that I showed you, uh, developed by Jürgen Bolton, unfamiliar multiplicity, how does this play out in the digital world? This is the whole um, aim and the whole goal of the Regical Project. So we want to understand digital interculturality. Yeah. So how does the digital change the, the concept of intercultural or how... Um, does it potentialize interculturality? This is the final goal. We want to, to understand all the, the specifics of digital interculturality, basically. Yeah, <laughs> I hope I, I answered the question. <clears throat> Great. In the, I probably Vone is still online. So then Vone, you are most welcome to, you know, continue visiting the, the project and participate. Uh, in the in the events that uh, you know they will put together, and of course to come here with us, Danielle. Anything else? It's it's almost twelve in Brazil. What time? Well, it's three or four o'clock in 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 Germany, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Danielle, 
I think uh, I think our time is up, right? So it's okay. People on YouTube right. are complimenting or saying are saying thank you. And uh -huh. you can check the comments later. Uh Milani, thank you very much. You see, Milani, this 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 talk uh you know it, it, it two hours that fly because you know it's so interesting. So then uh, anyway, we're going to to finish. Before I pass on uh, to Milani to you know to give us uh, the final words for today, so I really would like to thank uh, you know everyone the, you know our our colleagues on on the YouTube channel. I think Mario is there, Milani, I, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> and of course uh, you know Juliana, Danielle, Beatriz, Coliana, and very a, a special thanks uh, to Kurt for being here with us. It's it's. A great pleasure, you know, having you with us, Kurt. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your presence here and your contribution. So, uh, as uh, you know, we all say you are an inspiration to all of us. So, thank you very much for being here. And of course, I have to thank Milena, or Milani, sorry, for you know this wonderful uh, talk, for this wonderful uh, exchange of. Uh, knowledge and information. I'm sure after this presentation, Milani, a lot of people are going to communicate with you and, and uh, will be interested in getting to know more about your great work. Uh, mm -hmm. So before I pass on the word to you, uh, Danielle will, will finish up like uh, he will, he's going to stop, uh, you know, the broadcast. So then I ask you to stay with us for the final picture. <laughs> All right. So, Milene, thank you again, once again, for this great, great uh, talk and, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, for being here with us. We really, really appreciate your uh, presence here. So, one more to our great collection. Thank you very much. Mm. Muito obrigado. Obrigada, so <laughs> Obrigadíssima, muito obrigada. Foi super legal. It was super. It was great. And um, and the questions they're also very inspiring. I took lots of notes here, and they're going to help me uh, further with my reflections, my further studies. And please do contact me if you have any questions. If you'd like to know more about Rodico, about the data. Um, and well, let's stay in contact and I'm sure we will because uh, Savi and I, we're already talking a lot and, and involved in, in, in projects together. Yes, we have good plans together. And now I learned the pronunciation is the radico, right? Hedico. I was yeah. saying radical, but then, uh, you know. No, great. nobody knows how to pronounce it. It's always, uh, people are like, what? When, when people are introducing us, we always see this like, oh, now we'd like to call uh, Mileni from <laughs> we, we understand it's kind of a clumsy name but uh yeah <laughs> but it's a very nice project <laughs> okay great kurt if you'd like to say five some words before we go no not not really i mean i i just love being here and and a big thanks to me Lene. it's uh, i'm i'm really happy that i that i uh, well that you pass this info around and that I uh, jumped on on board. Great. Thank you very much. Very inspiration. Maybe so, when I go back to Germany, I, I come to visit you. Who knows? Right, Milani? Yeah, right. Exactly. Tour. A German tour here. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Now, Daniel, you are the one to control us now in terms yes. of what to do, please. <laughs> I have the power. <laughs> yes. So uh, I, I'm going to ask you, Milene, Savio, Beatriz, Professor Khan, Julie, Polly, to stay here. We're going to say goodbye to people on YouTube and yes. stay here for our photograph. So let's say goodbye. So Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. See you next month. Okay, done. <laughs>